Today we will be discussing the cannabis market, but let's start with the basics. What even is the cannabis market? So the cannabis market is a fancy way of talking about the marijuana market and the legalization of its production and distribution in a few states, including our very beautiful Washington state. Uh, the order to legalize it was called Initiative 502, commonly shortened to I-502. There are three categories within the cannabis market, medical, recreational, and the underground. The first two being legalized and the latter obviously not. So you may be wondering, why was it legalized? Uh, so basically the reason, there were three reasons as to why it was passed. Uh, one was to be able to create entrepreneurship opportunities for everyone who wished to do so. Uh, the second was to reduce gang drug wars. Uh, keep African Americans out of prison and create a safer environment by introducing organization, structure, and regulation. And the last reason for passing the initiative was just the fact that the current policies uh, in place at the time were not effective in dealing with any of the issues. We believe the initiative which did introduce organizations and entrepreneurship opportunities for sellers can be seen as an example of this desperate impact as it could have caused disproportionate adverse effects against groups based on race and criminal background. <clears throat> in today's production, we are going to explore these social inequalities in the cannabis market by interviewing two people. The first is Nick Licata, who is a sociologist from the University of Washington, who was a formal, former Seattle City Council president involved in legal activism of cannabis who wrote a book called Becoming a Citizen Activist. The second is an officer from the Seattle Police Department. Yeah, so, I'm Nick Licata, um, a former Seattle City Council member and author of uh, Becoming a Citizen Activist. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for yeah, sure. letting us interview you. Yeah. All right, um, so we had a list of questions uh, that we were interested in asking you. Some of them you may or may not have asked or uh, answered already uh, in class. Um, but our first question is, uh, in your experience, um, has the cannabis market, ever since the cannabis market has been, has any form of racial inequality as related to marijuana? Why didn't it work? If so, how? Well, I've seen where there is I mean, there's a certain amount of recognition of how the marijuana laws, in particular, in the past have been enforced as a result of people spending jail time. And now the irony is that one of the areas where a number of those people may have been arrested uh, is on 23rd Union, and now have legal recreational marijuana shop opened up. And uh, it's, you know, it's not the back market, it's a bump in the top and open. And they're making lots of money. And there's people now who are still in jail, who literally haven't done the same thing. Market advice, but that kind of place, no right. So, in the sense that I, I can't say like how many entrepreneurs in the cannabis market are with the right right now. Although I suspect the top two like overall what you see in society in general are my notice are underrepresented because we have better access to investment tools. Right. We have a lower level of wealth. So I don't think just because the product is just cannabis or you're going to see a more ethical um, distribution of ownership. What do you think needs to be done in order to close the gap in the cannabis market and close uh, racial inequality and social and well, probably the same thing that you need to have with the other of small business. That is, you need to have access to investment. The small business administration, I think, has been not really directed towards closing that gap, particularly, you know, we're talking about divisions and ethnic groups, the largest in the world. Certainly, in the last week, the Great Recession, the amount of wealth was reduced in that. And you cannot start a business unless you have someone who to cast it. And usually you need uh, to go to a bank and if they ask you for all the very sort of details, it's very difficult for someone who doesn't have uh, you know, big actors, financial actors. 
So I think the best way to cause that is just kind of the same way we run a great deal of money, but as a small business, yeah, we need to have more, uh, I would say, robust loaning policy for people who uh, represent groups that have been cut out of the market and have those opportunities. And I think what we really want to do is make sure that we have opportunities across the board for all types of people and to be just limited to those who have access to uh, money, quite honestly, then we are we built in a, uh, a bias, an institutional bias. So we need to change that. According to Nick Licata, people currently involved in the cannabis market are making a profit selling marijuana in the same locations where individuals did the exact same thing prior to the passing of I-502, and those individuals are still in jail. Those individuals arrested for doing the same things that people are making a profit off of now will, will also have a cr criminal record on their background. This will make it difficult to enter the cannabis market equally like everybody else and to get jobs in general. This shows discrimination based on criminal records just like Diva Pager's mark of a criminal, uh, which also widens the racial inequality between blacks and whites in similar markets because blacks are arrested at a higher rate than whites for the same crimes, meaning there are more blacks with a criminal record who will have trouble getting a job after release from prison and a difficult time entering the cannabis market more than whites. Right, so uh, it's me, Eliazar, and uh, neighbor Chris, uh, and we're gonna start this interview, I guess. Uh, Do you believe a neighborhood's socioeconomic status contribute to how suspicion is viewed or how police decide where to police? Uh, not on a patrol level. On I, a patrol. I don't, okay. you know, the department, they deploy resources and right. detectives and, uh -huh. And stuff that's a much higher level, okay. um, but we don't see it at the patrol level. Uh, I see. Oh, that's good. So, as uh, uh, Officer uh, Walter, you, uh, yep. All right. So, uh, just just two questions. Yeah, yeah. So, like, so what what defines suspicious behavior in terms of marijuana to the point where it's legal to stop a person and actively search them? Uh, well, well, to stop them, to just be smoking marijuana in public. Okay. Uh, yeah. To search them, maybe even more than marijuana. You can't just search somebody off of marijuana. Right. There have to be some other factors. Uh, right. Comfort frisk factors, you know, maybe. Yeah, it'd be something else other than marijuana. Okay. Right, that's good. So, how does a uh, neighborhood's socioeconomic status contribute to how suspicion is viewed? So, they get into how suspicions. So, uh, socioeconomic status contribute to. Uh, suspicions. Just it's mainly just off uh, the problems that the citizens in that area have reported. Right. So we just base that the, the crimes that are committed in that area and, and citizen complaints. Okay. That's what we did distinguish what uh, what uh, suspicious behavior is. That goes for higher economic class places right. and lower economic class places. That's good. Our last question. So so what do you think about the legalization of marijuana? Any thoughts? Any, oh, any? I have no issue with it. I mean, it was treated the same as alcohol. I mean, it's, right. it's a revenue source for the state. Right. And, yeah. Okay. Power to the state. Yeah. But like, but what about like you know like the differences in like you know like a federal and state you know stuff you know like yeah. I mean, it's kind of strange how the right. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of strange how the because I, I know that yeah, federal is still legal, but state wise does it so. I don't know. It's kind of, you know, it's more political on that, that aspect of what I yeah. So, yeah. But however they're doing it, we should, I'll just enforce whatever, whatever the city tells us to do. All right. That's good. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Based on what Officer Carson and Walter said in their interviews, we have learned a few things. One is that officers don't decide where to police. It's based on the numbers of complaints from the neighborhoods that determine where policing needs to be done versus a neighborhood socioeconomic status. Also, policing is less of an officer's job and more of a higher-ups like detectives. They seem to have less of an understanding of the regulations regarding cannabis law, and that such regulations rest in the hands of governments. This shows how governments are like gangs from walk-offs, violent entrepreneurs, where the police serves to follow the demands of the government, even though the government is benefiting of the sales of cannabis market, just like individuals and gangs are. The only difference is that one is seen as illegal. Based on our research and informational interviews, we can conclude that there is indeed racial inequality within the cannabis market. We thought that the inequality might reduce significantly if there was a more liberal way to review people's applications to get licenses. They usually favor only white people. 
Another thing we can do to combat this inequality is to attempt to end the stigma that comes on when discussing the cannabis market. Once the general public realizes that marijuana is not just a gateway drug and that it has a variety of purposes, we are confident that the level of inequality within the market will decrease. Thank you for your time and watching our production and have a great day. Yay! We did it! Yay! Yay! Yay!